Well, good evening. Um, I don't know where I've been the last couple weeks. I've been in, I guess we were in England, and then we were in Canada. I don't even know all the places I've been. I'm trying to think where I've been. But I don't feel like I've been here for a while, have I? Have I been here for a while? Was I? So, oh, South Carolina. Then, okay, there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Woo. I'm, getting, I'm getting older. It's, it's bad. Um, in any case, we're sure glad you're here tonight, and we're expecting really neat things of the Lord. We, we are taking a group from our church uh, down to, um, we're Anglican, if, whatever that means to you, and we're going down to do a healing mission uh, down in Orlando this weekend, Friday night, and then two sessions on Saturday. Um, and so we're taking a team. And so the first thing we're going to do after I speak tonight is we're going to pray for our team. Uh, that will not take a long time. Uh, well, you never know, but I don't think it'll take a long time. <laughs> Maybe if one of our ministers starts screaming, it might take a while. I don't know. We'll see. Just never know. But anyway, uh, depending upon what happens, we don't expect it to take a long time, but we do want to pray uh, and uh, for that uh, and for this coming mission. Then we want to pray for everyone. And so uh, if I can get Don and Lisa and some of the others, we'll get to come in to help pray during that time. If you would, I, I, I would, for my preparation for this weekend, uh, one of my favorite texts about uh, God's movement and healing is uh, kind of captured me so many years ago from Acts chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Acts chapter 4, verses 23 to 37. Now, <clears throat> the context of Acts chapter 4 was that the apostles had been uh, put in jail and they had been beaten uh, it didn't look like they were going to get out. They didn't know they were going to even get their lives, but it ends up they were uh, beaten uh, and then released, really by a miraculous intervention. Um, the kind of miracles that I'm praying for is if I ever get imprisoned is that I get released without being beaten, just so you know. Uh, if you ever wonder how to pray for me if I'm in India or someplace and end up in jail, you pray that I will be released without a beating. That would be the way. But it tells us, I mean, sometimes prayers are answered powerfully, and yet we don't really understand completely why, but the enemy is allowed to work through people and to do really horrible things. We have a friend of ours, uh, Rena is more connected than I am, but a guy that I went to Wheaton College with, and he is in jail in Turkey uh, unjustly and really struggling, which... Um, you know, some of us can appreciate, some of us have never seen any jail anywhere, but, but uh, nonetheless, some of us have seen at least the movies and things and understand just how difficult and horrible it would be, and uh, we need to be praying for Andrew Brunson, and uh, we haven't, we, they, they delayed it another month, right? July, yeah. Well, what they do is when the, all the outside world's paying attention, they just delay it, hoping everybody won't come back. Um, and so that's part of the strategy, of course. But we want to remember to pray for him and many others around the world who are experiencing uh, lots of terrible things uh, for, for Jesus' sake. And, and uh, so, in any case, after this section of Scripture, Acts chapter 4, uh, 23 to 37, it picks up right where they're released, and they, the Bible says they go to their own, which is kind of dear, uh, a way of saying they went to the church, they went to their brothers and sister believers, uh, and it talks about that they went to their own. So let's pick up the text here in Acts chapter 4, uh, verses 23 to 37. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God. Now, they're all hearing this. They raised their voice to God with one accord. Now, this does not mean that they were, when they raised their voice with one, raised their voice with one accord, this doesn't mean they were all praying at the same time. This means they were praying with one heart. There would have been someone leading, and there would have been everybody else would be praying along with um, the other people. And so I say that because I'm often in charismatic and Pentecostal churches as I travel, and they'll be all praying at the same time. Um, it's not my place to tell them how to pray. Uh, but I can tell you the first couple times it happened, I was very shocked. I had never heard that, never seen that. I grew up in the Baptist church and, and uh, someone prayed, and everybody else sort of prayed long or faded out depending upon uh, their heart or whatever. But I, I can tell you, if you've never, never seen that, then it's quite overwhelming. And then sometimes they'll be all praying in the Holy Spirit or they'll be singing in the Holy Spirit. And that's a little, I say weird, but from the perspective of outsider, it, it grows on you. But it's, it's, uh, 
if you're not used to it, it can be a little, uh, uh, I don't want to say shocking, but it can be a little off-putting at first if you're not familiar with that kind of thing. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14 talks about not doing things and having everyone pray at once in tongues in terms of the outsider. What I think a lot of uh, non-charismatics forget is that not every service is a public service where it's about the outsider. So sometimes when a service is a teaching and a equipping service, uh, those scriptures would not necessarily apply in the same way. Now, if you had your Sunday morning public ministry time, that may be a different service. That may be a time where you would want to look at 1 Corinthians 14 a little bit more carefully. Uh, but not every service is that way or not every small group or whatever. It would not necessarily be inappropriate. In any case, I find that we all do better when we don't fix everybody else. Uh, if we just kind of take care of ourselves. And if someone asks, then I'm glad to tell them all the perfect answers. But I don't get asked very often. You're not going to believe it. But, but people don't ask me much. But um, in any case, so, but we might read it differently. But, but in the Greek here, this is, so when they heard that, they raised their voice to God. And with one accord, all with one heart said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. They begin to praise him. Uh, they, they just couldn't believe the goodness of God because they thought those guys were, were dead. And even though they got a beating, uh, that was considered to be a tremendous grace that they at least had been released, uh, and they were back with the church. So, Lord God, you are God. You, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David, now they start quoting, quoting scripture. Now, if you want to know how to pray, you'll find that people who really know how to pray, they're always quoting scripture. You don't find people who really know how to pray who don't pray God's thoughts and hearts back to him. So that's one of the great secrets of prayer is to, to know God's word and then to pray. You don't have to have it all memorized. That will help, of course. But you'll find people that really, when they pray and, and heaven and earth moves, they, they're people who will pray God's word back to him. There's, there's nothing, how could you have more faith that when you're praying exactly what God says he wants to do back to him? I mean, I think it's about faith. I think it's about a lot of things. But you'll find, I don't care if you go back to the Andrew Murray, I don't care where you go back into the Saints, Teresa Avila, you will find that people who were known to be holy people and people who moved God in prayer and that got answers for prayer, there were people who were very acquainted with God's word and they used God's word in their prayers. Not unlike we see, of course, this uh, testimony here as they're praying, they start to praise God, then they begin to quote God's word uh, to him in their prayer. Uh, so this might be instruction for us. Because at the end of this text, we know that the, they had an earthquake. God answered with a, with a big, we, wouldn't, wouldn't it be neat of all of our prayers when we got an answer, when we wondered if God heard us and said yes, if we had a nice earthquake without the building, well, without the building falling in. I mean, uh, uh, a healthy earthquake. Um, that would be good. So, who by the mouth of your servant David, verse 25, has said, why did the nation, nations Excuse me, I can't speak. Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things, empty things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ, his Messiah. So she so said, why? Why did this? Because people who don't know God don't realize the enemy is manipulating them and putting thoughts and ideas in their hearts. That's why the Bible says we don't wrestle against just flesh and blood. It's not just the crazy people. The problem with the people that are hurting us is they don't know the voice of God. So, so they're hearing the enemy and don't know it's the enemy. They think, Jesus said, that they're doing good even when they try to kill you. And, and that's what we had to remember. It's not, I mean, yes, yeah, the people that are punching you or beating you, or whatever, but, but it's, it's not really just the people. It's the people don't have the discernment to know the difference between the voice of God and the devil and, of course, their own voice. So why do they rage? Why do the nations gnashing their teeth and hating the Messiah? Well, because they're under the influence, in this case, of the demonic, of the devil. All right. Look at this. We're almost halfway done. This is, I mean, this is terrible. We need to draw this out a little bit. All right. For truly, your holy servant Jesus, what a way to describe him. Your set apart one, the, the one that's especially equipped and anointed, your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Do, do you hear what he's saying? He's saying, 
they had these people. It was Pilate, and it was Herod, and it was Judas, and all these people played their role. But they were all free to do right or not. But, but God had ordained that Jesus would die on the cross. But it didn't have to be Judas who betrayed him. Did you realize that? Jesus had to be betrayed, but it didn't have to be Judas. You know, if you don't lock up your bike, I mean, someone's going to steal it, but it didn't have to be the person that did. I mean, you can pretty much know, you go to University of Florida, pull up with a decent bike, leave it there, and you don't lock it, it's going to get stolen. But, that, but, but, but the guy can't say when, you get, when he gets caught, say, well, uh, it was going to get stolen anyway. Well, well, yeah, but you were the guy that did it. Okay, you, it didn't have to be you. It could have been someone else. So it didn't have to be Judas, but it was Judas. It didn't have to be Pilate, but it was Pilate. But, but Jesus did, and was ordained. The lamb was slain before the foundation of the earth, the Bible says. And God had a plan, and in God's plan, he knew that we would fall, that we would turn against him in sin, and that we would need Jesus, the perfect man, to come and to restore us to God through his perfect life and his death on the cross. And that was known. And so, so they're saying, with all this stuff going on, and all these very powerful people, Herod, he had all the power in Israel, and Caesar and Rome, all, say, but, but ultimately, all these people were acting according to a big plan, which was ultimately to bring salvation to all those who would love the Father's Christ or Jesus. So for truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. It could have said to gather together against is what it means there. To gather together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, this is one of my very, very favorite verses. And I'm not sure if I memorize the New American Standard or the, or, or the King James. Does anybody have a new uh, NASB tonight? You do? So, let the gospel that we preach be strengthened. So that's what it says? How's the New American Standard say? Strengthen the world, the word that we preach with signs and wonders fall. 29. Strengthen. And that's New American Standard? All right. Anyone got the NIV? I hope I didn't just make it up when I memorized it. I tried to, I'm pretty sure it's a real translation. But st st What's that? Great boldness. All right. Well, maybe it's a King James. One of them says, strengthen the gospel that we preach with signs and wonders following. Um, so this is, a, this is powerful. Okay, let's get back. So 29. Now, Lord, now they're praying specifically, and this is what we're praying for our team tonight. This is what we're, before we would go out to preach or to teach or to minister, this is exactly what we're asking the Holy Spirit to help us to do. This is what, if you come to a healing service, this is what you hope the people have prayed before you got there. Because there's nothing worse than going to a healing service and people are praying, but without the power of the Holy Spirit, because it won't really help you that much. When people really get healed, things like that is when the Holy Spirit is, has been surrendered to and submitted to, and he is being activated in our lives and prayers. And that's what we want for you. Uh, what could be more boring than just a, a well-intended prayer if it's not empowered by the Holy Spirit? I tell you, some, some boring prayers get excited when, excited, exciting, they get exciting when the Holy Spirit shows up. I mean, do you know that boring sermons become very exciting when the Holy Spirit shows up? I had preached a sermon here in Gainesville, and it, no one cared. And I've been in India where the Holy Spirit showed up, and that same sermon, thousands of people got excited. But the difference was the Holy Spirit moved differently. The sermon was still pretty average, okay? But an average sermon with the Holy Spirit, it's a great sermon, okay? It's a great sermon when the Holy Spirit shows up. It, all of a sudden, everything's different when the Holy Spirit shows up. Now, Lord, look on their threats because they had threatened to kill them if they continued. Now, look on their threats. Now, this is interesting. They didn't say, now kill our enemies, that's what I'd be praying. Lord, destroy the wicked. <laughs> Protect me from... He just said, Lord, we're just laying them out before you. Look at the threats. You look, you evaluate. Lord, you judge what needs to be done. We're not here to tell God what he's supposed to do. Because we don't know what. We don't know which ones are the wheat and uh, the tares and the wheat. Some of the very people doing the most evil things will get saved. And, and, and what if we had been the ones praying of their destruction? 
It's not for us to pray that. We, Lord, you look at the threats, you figure it out. You know what to, what, what's what and who to, who's who. And what. By no means would a sinner go unpunished. We can count on our righteous God. But it is not our place to be telling God to be hurting people or destroying our enemies or whatever. Not without some very clear warrant, let's say that. I mean, there are 75% of the Psalms where David does that, but that's another theological section for another day. Uh, well, sometimes, sometimes when, we're really, when you really want some encouragement, I'll preach on imprecatory prayers. Prayers where you do pray for the destruction of your enemy. But, but I think what you see is that David was not praying just about the people. He was praying about the demons. I think you can see that in a number of the Psalms. You can see that, that it doesn't really apply if it were only to the people. He's really talking to the demons working through the evil people. But, but that is another subject for another day, and that'll really encourage you. When you're feeling kind of low, you come and we'll do imprecatory prayer night, uh, and that'll really get you inspired. Praying for the destruction of your enemy. Lord, tear them limb from limb. All right, but now, this is not what they did here. Here he says, now Lord, you look on their threats. We're laying them out before you. Hezekiah did this. He laid out the things of his enemies and said, Lord, now you, we're spreading them out. But the Bible says, and I think the King James says, he spread out. He spread out the, the threats and things that were supposed to happen before the Lord in prayer and laid them all out and just said, now Lord, we're asking for you to do whatever you see best. So the first thing, even though these people were evil, threatened to kill them, had already beaten them, they just brought the threats, just said, here's the situation, Lord. You know what's best. Glorify your name in this situation. And only one time, I'm 52, there was only one crisis of my life where I had the maturity to say, Lord, do whatever is to the most glory and honor of your name. And every big obstacle before that time, I had always prayed the best and quickest escape possible. The best and quickest escape didn't always happen, but that's what I prayed for. But only in one time of my life, and I'm hoping, well, actually, I'm not hoping I don't get any more chances for any terrible days, but, but nonetheless, they will come. Uh, but I can say this, on this one particular instance, I felt the Father's effort, because I, I realized sometimes we pray for escape from a situation and God was still trying to work to glorify his name. And sometimes we can pray ourselves out of something that is not finished, and then we only have to repeat the trial the next time. And so you're like, well, you're already, you're already 80% there. You might as well get all of it, Lord. Just do whatever it takes, whatever you got to kill in me, whatever it is that's got to change. Do it all, do it now. Because I've repeated the same trial many, many times. Because it's all past fail. You just have to do it again. And, and it's past fail, and you can't ever fail permanently as a believer. So you just get to do it again and again and again and again and again. And I, and I did that for a lot of years. And, but one time, out of hundreds of bad ones, but one time in my life, I realized, Lord, as terrible and much as this is hurting me, whatever will bring you the most honor and glory. And I knew when those words, I, I was sitting in my prayer chair, so I'm not sure if I ever I said them out loud, but, but when that thought came to me, I knew the Holy Spirit was doing something because I knew that's not how I pray. I knew God was doing something. My goodness. Do whatever bring most of the glory and honor to your name. This is what they're praying here. How tremendous that we could be start to, Lord, we're not just asking for escape. We Lord, we're laying this all situation, this terrible situation, we're laying it before you, Lord. Glorify your name in the highest and greatest use of our lives. Whatever that is, glorify your name in this situation. That's a tough thing to pray, but it's a beautiful thing to pray. If I had thought about it, I wouldn't have prayed it. Sometimes you're just praying, the Holy Spirit takes over, and that was one of those, I thought, my word. That was something. I, I might have put the words back in my mouth if I could have. Now, Lord, look on their threats. And then they say, and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. You, you see, they had been on a mission. Jesus told them to preach the gospel. And that's what they had been doing when they got into trouble. The trouble had already started, and, and, and they knew more trouble was on its way. But they were asking for a supernatural grace to be bold, even though they knew that on many occasions they would get beaten up for it. I mean, Wesley would, went, would go into towns, and they would kick him and beat him. He was a small little guy. 
and they would literally kick him and beat him all the way through and tumble him from one side of a town to the other in England on many, many occasions. Beat the heck out of him. But he had all boldness. In his hometown, they wanted to tar and feather him. He ran, this little guy, he runs in this town and he goes into the cemetery next to the church. He's an Anglican minister, but they, didn't, they hated him. The demons and those people, they hated Wesley and the Holy Spirit. He jumps on the, his father's tombstone and the crowd was there, but they wouldn't knock him off the tombstone of his father. And he preached the gospel with great power and they hated him. But the world changed. With, with the ones that hated him, there was a whole lot more that heard, were impacted by the Holy Spirit with true conviction, true repentance, and true faith and salvation. But can you imagine going places knowing that it's a good chance that's the reception you're going to get? You're going to be kicked and beaten from one side of a town to the other. Many times that's what happened to him. And this is what Peter, Peter and Paul, really, not Peter and Paul here, excuse me. P Peter and John, they, they knew what had happened and they knew it was going to happen again. But they said, but Lord, give us great boldness by your to go and to do what you called us to do. And not to be thinking about all the things that can happen because they can happen and sometimes they will happen. Now, I don't know why. I don't think they knew why. Grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand. Part of the boldness is coming with the power of the Spirit. And I'm saying, okay, as we have all boldness, part of what you can do to strengthen the word that we're preaching here is that you would pour out your Spirit and what? That you would stretch out your hand. Now, whose hands were going to be laying hands on the people that were sick? Their hands. But they had Jesus in their heart by faith. They had the Holy Spirit living within them, empowering them. So they're saying that the Holy Spirit, that, that God, using their crummy hands, that God would come through their crummy hands and pour out his mighty power through his hand, through their hands. That's what happened. When we pray tonight and people get healed, that's what happens. My fingernails are relatively well cut. My, my beard is not trimmed very well. I'm going to trim tomorrow morning. I've, I've showered today. I'm in pretty good shape. But I mean, this is ultimately a crummy little body, but, but we're going to lay hands on people tonight and demons will leave and, and, and spirits of death will go and all kinds of things are going to happen. But it's just my little crummy hands, little chubby crummy hands. <laughs> but because Jesus lives in my heart by faith and we're submitted and strengthened to the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will come. And because God loves you, he will use even people like me. That's amazing. It's amazing. I'm not surprised Jesus did all this incredible stuff. What's amazing to me is that he uses people like me and people like you. Actually, I've been way more impressed with other people than myself because I don't know what they're like when they're hungry. I know I get grouchy when I'm hungry. I know all my weaknesses, at least, I, at least a bunch of them. I don't know all of yours. Lord, look at their threats. Grant to your servants that with all boldness, they, your servants, may speak your word. And the word of God has power. So when they talk about the saving grace and power of Jesus, that people would experience it. Jesus said, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, or rise up and walk. See, the gospel has power even to heal, even to cast out demons, because embedded in the gospel is that the one who has the power to deal with the moral guilt of sin has the power to reverse the effects of sin and to set us free from the addiction and slavery to sin. So it's just, which is easier? I mean, if I got the, I got the power, you, you know that when you see the healing, that the one, has to, that the one who's doing the healing has to have greater power than the one who brought the sickness into the universe, the enemy in the garden all those years earlier. So says, which is easier? So he said, strengthen the gospel that we preach. Strengthen this word. How? Oh, when they're preaching the gospel, then they're saying, now, then we're going to lay hands. We're going to preach the gospel. And part of the preaching is then the application that we're going to pray and we're going to minister and then pour out your spirit. By stretching out your hand to heal. That would be nice. 
and that signs and wonders that many things would happen that only God could do that everybody just be like, wow, who would have guessed God could have fixed that that quickly? I thought I was going to take a long time. Jesus did it like that. I, I've seen some wonders. I haven't seen them in the States. One of the things I long for is to see what I have seen in other places happen here. There's no reason, uh, except perhaps some of our unbelief, that, that it's not happening here. I, I, I mean, I have no, I don't know the reason, but, but I know this. This is what I'm praying. By stretching out your hand, strengthen the gospel that we preach. Stretching out your hand to heal that signs and wonders may be done. How? Not because we're really cool and hip. We're super anointed. No, no. How? How does it happen? Through the name of Jesus. Because we're holding Jesus' hand. All the power comes from him. All the power comes from him. I mean, we get to do it. It gets to be my crummy hand or someone else's, but, but it's God's hand on the inside. It is power. It's the name of Jesus. That's how it's happening. Don't be impressed. I mean, it's, it's, I'll be honest with you. I've had people pray for me, and when God touched me, I was impressed. But catch yourself. Don't get, just remember, it's wonderful. What you should be impressed about is that there are people who are opening themselves up and surrendering themselves to the Holy Spirit to be used. But don't be impressed at the power of the person. The power is God's. What we're th- but I tell you something, if you're going to be impressed, be impressed with people who humble themselves and walk with Jesus and are yielded to Jesus and believe his word when other people are saying it's crazy and God uses them. That's to, that, you can be impressed with that okay a little bit, just in the sense they're being faithful. I'm amazed at the people. I mean, I, I used to preach that none of this happened. And then I tell you, I was impressed to find some people that said, no, the Bible says it and they believed it. I thought, well, I believe the Bible too. I just didn't think the Bible applied anymore like that. The effective prayer, the, the, the effective prayer, uh, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much. A righteous one. I know some righteous men and women. I'm impressed with that. Some people who've died to themselves daily, take up the cross of Jesus, and let Jesus operate in and through them. That's pretty cool. But it's not nearly as cool as that God's got the power, and in his name, healing and deliverance and signs and wonders follow those who love him and who are submitted to him and preach his word faithfully. Now, this is, this is what we want at the end of every sermon, even tonight. This is how you can judge how good a sermon this was tonight. I'm kind of teasing, but here we go. It's a, high, it's a high bar. Look at verse 31. And when they prayed, so you know you're not in the right place, right, when this doesn't happen. When, when this happens, listen, when this happens, you're in the right place. Amen. Okay? Demons may be manifesting because the Holy Spirit's there. Don't be freaked out because the Holy Spirit's there and demons are manifesting and it's crazy because let me tell you something, when Jesus finally shows up in this country and in a revival again, it's going to be a zoo. (laughs) There's so many demons, it's going to be a zoo. No matter what church he comes in, it's going to be a zoo. It'll be holy bedlam. I've seen in India, I've seen holy bedlam. Because when Jesus comes, the demons start manifesting. So some people say, oh, that wasn't the Holy Spirit, that was the demon. No, why was the demon showing out here when he doesn't show out over there? Because Jesus was here. And whenever Jesus was places, guess what happened? Demons couldn't hide. So don't be freaked out. Just be thankful. Man, you were someplace where God's presence was where the demons couldn't hide. And when they prayed, the place where they assembled together was shaken. Can you imagine as I pray right, right before we pray with others, I start praying all of a sudden the, the building starts shaking? That's the kind of prayer life I'm looking for. I've even seen that happen one time when I was in Argentina. Mm. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what won for our team. We want to be strengthened that as we preach and as we minister this weekend, at Christ the King Episcopal Church in Azalea Park, that the Holy Spirit would pour out and the gospel would be strengthened, signs and wonders, healings, the demonstration of God's wonderful salvation be poured out, and that we would be filled with the Spirit to accomplish these things. 
that in Jesus' name, uh, the gospel will go forth and his kingdom would manifest. So when they prayed, the place where they assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, in the Hebrides, there have been many revivals where the people there, believers and non-believers, attested to the fact that there were prayer meetings where the Holy Spirit showed up and it was like an earthquake. Listen, I mean, we, we might just say, well, it's only happening in Acts. That's, that was for back then. But we know by people well attested, non-believers and believers, that this has happened multiple times in history. So you got to know what you're aiming for. We're aiming for praying in such a way that the Holy Spirit would come and, and that we would be, I mean, in Argentina when we prayed this one time, I was on a stage at a Plymouth Brethren Church, not a church that's historically been open to the gifts and power and working of the Holy Spirit. But I prayed in this church. I was down leading a uh, retreat for Operation Mobilization, the mission group, and I was down in this church preaching, and when I preached on forgiveness in this church, and I began to pray, the, the stage, and I hate to say it, in their church it's a stage, it's not an altar, it's a stage, and on the stage of this building began to shake, and it was like I was on a surfboard or something. I grew up in California, and I knew the, you know, the way you were sure, you could feel the, the shake, and then you look in the swimming pool, and you, oh, it's an earthquake. Because you couldn't be sure, am I on drugs or is it, well, no, it's an earthquake. It was some kind of sign. I'm not, I still don't know what it meant. But I know this, it was a sign. It's never happened before or since in my life. But I, but I hope it happens a lot of times. Now, I want to ask our team to come forward. because I want to pray over them. And Jackie, I mean, uh, would you mind getting the key and so I can get my oil out? It's in the... We're just going to pray for a minute for our team. And after the shaking and the dust, then you come on up.